I think unsexy sectors of the S and P, like materials. I can't think of a less, uh, you know, a, a a sector of the S and P which has suffered from low valuations, right, more than materials, right. But these will be important again, and I think it's beginning to actually play a role in in uh, public diplomacy. You see, the Biden administration worried about elements no one even knew about, like tellurium and gallium, <laughs> or you know, uh, to say nothing of 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 of, of, of silicon and and uh, and and lithium and and some of the rare earth metals. Well, what what's happening here? I thought it was all about experience economy and digital this, digital that. You know what I mean? I thought it was all about media companies. No, this is the new this is the new era of the fourth turning. Right? We're going to be worrying about stuff, and we're going to be worrying about energy, as you pointed out. Think. Tuned into the Money Level Show. Hello, everyone. It's Daryl from the Money Level Show, and here we think, act, and prosper. This channel focuses on changing financial trajectories and building legacies. Today, we have the opportunity of interviewing Neil Howe. Neil Howe is the author of the books Generations, The Fourth Turning, and the new book The Fourth Turning is Here. A fun fact about Neil is that he and his partner Bill coined the term millennials, which represents my generation. Neil is a demographer that focuses on the cycle of history within the United States and how this history can inform us on what to expect in the future. According to Neil's research, we are currently in the fourth turning, which is set to end around the year 2030. So as we interview Neil today, please put on your thinking caps and think about how to protect yourself and your wealth moving forward. Yeah, that's a uh, that's really good. Um, especially, you know, for me, I'm I'm a father of three kids. You know, I have a 13, a five year old, and a one year old. You know, and so uh, just thinking, uh, you know, ahead, you know, to the this decade. I mean, and your projection shows like the the fourth turning. You know, coming to climax by what 2030 or something like that. Um, really teaching my kids like you know, the value of community and, you know, and training him up, training them up in that way. And so um, that's, that's very, very important to me. Uh, and I was, I was kind of wondering about, uh, cause you mentioned a little bit about fixed income assets. I think uh, 2030, I think 2030, every uh, baby boomer becomes the age of, I think 65 or, or something like that. And, um, and right now, you know, Social Security, you know, Medicare, I mean, just the projections on the, the amount of debt that is continuously increasing and, and how it's likely going to be reduced. I'm not banking on that to be there when I get that age, <laughs> by the way. Wow. Uh, so what does this look like for, you know, pension, Social Security, you know, retirement for people? I mean, retirement's a new phenomenon in, in the past, what, 200 years? I mean, when it was adopted widely after Germany, but what does yeah. it look like for for this this dream of like we go to our job and we get retirement or and you get social security? What does that look like? Um, you know, look, I think it's gonna be tough. I tough. I, I think it's gonna be toughest for for Xers. So it's it's really toughest for it'd be toughest for people now in their 50s. <laughs> because in a way, they're not old enough to be grandfathered. You know what I mean? I mean, inevitably when you start cutting some of this stuff or begin to uh uh you know, pair back on it. Some people are already totally dependent on it. They will be sort of, you know, exempt from any cuts, right? I mean, you'll say, we're, we're not going to cut for you. I think a lot of boomers, maybe unfortunately, won't have to face cuts. Uh, they they may, particularly in healthcare, I think they may. Uh, in healthcare of, of all the different entitlements we have is the most completely haywire, completely out of control. And I think the American healthcare system is a disgrace because it costs more every year and it's unaffordable for so many people privately, but the health that delivers is so inferior to so many other countries where it's cheaper. Um, this makes no sense to me. Right. Um, but in terms of cash benefits, 
I think what I worry most about is Xers because they're they're not old enough to be grandfathered. You know, they will just be retiring in this period, uh, but they're not old enough to have a lot of time to make it up later on. You know, I, I think a lot of millennials are in a better position. I mean, if you're today in your early 30s or mid 30s, um, there could be time enough left perhaps for a more prosperous America after the crisis has passed for you to catch up. Uh, this was true, for instance, for the GI generation after World War II. They served in the war. Uh, they came home. And uh, many of them had to give up their career for a while. And, and obviously, uh, uh, there was a, uh, many of them did come of age in the Great Depression. So they, they, they got hit initially. But there, were, there was time left in the post-war prosperity for them to make up a lot of income and actually do quite well, you know, much better off by the time they retired. The generation that really got hit by World War II uh, was the lost generation who was already in midlife during the Great Depression, already had been kind of wiped out. And uh, uh, they were devastated by inflation, you know, during and just after World War II. At that time, Social Security was not indexed for inflation. So, you know, the, the yeah. real value, the benefits shrank. And um, they they were hit very hard. And I think that the, the Gen Xers are going to be a little bit like the lost generation in that regard. I think younger generations will do better. But I think it's important to know what kind of assets do better and worse. And, you know, what's 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 worth a lot, what's worth relying on. Um uh, I do think too that generations differ on how much they rely on individualism versus. Uh, I think of all generations today, Xers are most the sort of survivalist generation, sort of the generation that really believes in sort of individual self sufficiency. One thing I've noticed about millennials ever since they were kids is how much more, um, uh, how much more interested they were enthusiastic about, about doing things in groups. You know what I mean? Sort of forming communities. And you see millennials were the first ones to really rush towards social media and live these fishbowl existences where, you know, everyone watches what they're doing all the time and they're watching everyone else and, and offering each other support. And you can see how often they're living together after going to college. And right. So the, the idea for millennials is, supervision and peers, you know, looking out for me all the time is something I'm used to and something I wish were part of the system. I don't think many Xers see it that way. <laughs> I think Xers like to keep their doors locked. You know what I mean? And uh, 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 aren't, aren't as enthusiastic about a huge amount of community or peer participation. So in a way, I think millennials are better suited uh, attitudinally as a generation, sort of their pure personality is sort of better suited for the era coming up, which will be more oriented toward community life. That will start as the as the crisis gets worse, as the crisis reaches its climax. But it's also going to be the mood of the era coming after the crisis, which will much more um, uh, showcase community life, much as the 1950s, very famously, was the decade, you know, was the decade of community. When you think about the American high, you think about a very strong middle class. You think about people who didn't mind living in identical houses in suburbia right? and who didn't mind uh, participating in very homogenous tastes in the in not only their houses, but their clothes and their washing machines and everything else. You know, they didn't mind sort of being an homogenous people because they were so community oriented. Um, and that era, which was in which individuals were very sort of modest about their individual claims, uh, was a period in which the community itself uh, did large things. You know, they balanced the budget every year, uh, uh, created interstate highways and miracle vaccines, and ultimately sent people to the moon. And I would add, by the end of that era, uh, this, this, they, they, but they uh, came to bipartisan agreement on on the Great Civil Rights Act, uh, which is kind of the cornerstone of the Great Society for that generation. That was LBJ, of course. That was part of the Greatest Generation, and 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 so they did that as well. You know, all for the sake of this larger idea of community. Um, 
I wonder if we would do that today. You know what I mean? I wonder if that's where our mood is today. I, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I was uh, I may be quoting this wrong. I was recently um, watching a uh, interview with uh, Larry Elder, and he mentioned a statistic uh, that in the 50s, um, that uh, poverty amongst African-Americans uh, was cut in half, uh, I believe. And um, and this this kind of, uh, you know, segues into like after the uh, fourth turning, you know, in, in the beginning of the new t- the new uh, cycle, say, uh, Saclium, I think that's how yeah, I think that's saclium, it, right? yeah. um, that there is a uh, reset in wealth, like the wealth gap is is uh, reduced um, quite a bit. And so uh, could you speak to more like what is that? How does that look in terms of. Um, because uh, right now the the wealth gap is is really is, it's really bad <laughs> right now and uh and I know a lot of people think about that and it makes a lot of a lot of young people furious um but uh, from what I've heard you say in other interviews is that usually this is um, decreased significantly in whenever the crisis occurs hello everyone sorry for the break in action but I want to tell you about the link in my description below this is to the New Orleans investment conference. This conference has been around for years and have brought many people out, such as Milton Friedman, Gerald Ford, Alan Greenspan, and Margaret Thatcher. This conference is put on by Brian Lundeen and his team. Brian is the CEO of Gold Newsletter. This year, they're going to have speakers such as Jim Rickards, George Gammon, Peter Schiff, Rick Rule, Danielle DiMartino Booth, Lynn Alden, and many others. Now, I encourage you to click the link in the description below. You can choose to attend the live event, which I will likely be at, as well as the event that is live streamed. You can support the channel by using my link below. So I encourage you to check that out. Now let's get back to the interview. As it, it does. And, and this is a pattern, uh, you know, one of the big shifts from, from the beginning of the fourth turning to the end. I mean, the, the overall shift is from individualism to community, but, but some of the shifts within that are the, is the shift from privilege to equality. And that's not just equality as, you know, wealth and income measured by Gini coefficient, you know, just sort of mathematically measuring these things. And and you have to think about all the forces that equalize income. I mean, one is when you have a crisis going on, you often have to simply uh, destruction of wealth. You know, I mean, think of all the things that take wealth away from the people who already have. Well, if, if you have a real crisis, uh, you have often a lot of wealth being destroyed. Uh, you you also have suddenly new industries over that night uh, coming up to uh, perform new functions because the nation needs these new industries, right, uh, 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 just urgently. And this often completely displaces uh, uh, existing wealth holders, right? So you, so you also displace those who hold wealth. And you very often, uh, uh, through through inflation, and through automatic, you know, wealth transfers, <laughs> the rich always get taxed highly, right? During a crisis, uh, that always happens. And you take wealth away from the rich as well through inflation. I mean, one way or another, when society's in crisis, it takes from everyone anything they have to help society through the crisis. If you don't have wealth, you're drafted. If you do have wealth, they take your you take your assets. I mean, you think of the Civil War. I mean, the railroads were nationalized. The industries overnight were just taken over by government, right? I mean, when you need to survive, you take everything you can. What are the wealth? What do the wealthy have? They have property, so you take them. Uh, one of the little-known facts about um, about uh, uh, American industry is that at the end of World War II, nearly half of all the capital, the the uh, plant and equipment. Of, uh, of American corporations who was owned by the government, <laughs> you know, and now a lot of that was 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 sold back to the private sector in the in the in the wars in the years just after the war. But my point is this: the revolution in expectations when it comes to wealth, and then you have the rise of what uh, William White and the Organization Man calls the social ethic, which becomes very powerful after the war. You have an entire country going through this crisis, having coming together as a community to survive it. And then after the crisis, they continue to have this sort of ethic about community. You need to fit in with other people. You know what I mean? That's when William White talked about the social ethic. He talked, and by the way, that's something that 
boomers who remember the 50s, they hate about the 50s, right? Because he had to fit in, right? They hated that, right? So, uh, you know, a, a man would be told, you know, he'd, he'd wear his, his gray flannel suit to fit in, and he would have to do what the boss told him to do. You know, there's a sort of A-frame organizational pyramid. He'd have to fit in. The, 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 the wife would have to fit in. Uh, 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 young boys at school were told to be, you know, uh, 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 you know, breadwinners and, and you know, girls were told to be good housewife, right? Everyone had a role, right? And so we look back on that and we say, oh my God, you know, and, and <laughs> the idea behind it, not the idea behind those particular roles, but the idea behind it, the fundamental idea was Society sure works better when everyone has a role to do, right? So this to us today seems retrograde, but some definition of that always comes back during a first turning. And I, and I might just say, there is no perfect turning. You know, when everyone's talking about social moods, it's like, you know, there, there's one part of the cycle where you know, life is perfect for everyone. That's not how it works, Daryl. <laughs> you know, some things get better, but some things are more difficult, right? Some things are involve more stress. And in fact, much as the stress that comes out of a first turning is what later generates the awakening when people throw off all those roles, you know what I mean? But this is part of a longer term cycle. All I'm saying is, is that that, that sense of what William White called the social ethic will seem very welcome <laughs> in the next first, the first turning. And we always usually compare where we are with what we just went through. And the the American high seemed really good to people who had just been through the Great Depression and World War II, right? Um, and you're right about those uh, statistics on uh, income. Not only was the, was the late 40s and 1950s periods of very rapid growth in standard of living in, in real terms, but they were even more exceptional for minorities, and particularly African Americans, where you where you just saw these extraordinary rates of income growth, partly because many of them were in the South and were able to migrate out of the South, uh, and you know FDR issued those executive orders that required that that Black Americans be paid the same wages, you know, for World War II jobs, and that that was just a revolution uh, mm -hmm. uh, for for uh, uh, the, sort of the entire kind of African American population. And it, and it revolutionized their living standards, it revolutionized their expectations. But we don't think of, you know what I mean? We don't think about how that seemed to people at the time. We look back, you know, with other judgments. And one thing I will say is that we so often see history from our perspective today. We don't see it from the perspective of the people at the time. It's one of my biggest complaints we, we always think, well, we already knew where the world ended up, so we can go back and criticize how we, you know, got there. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a big problem when we look at history. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, and that's, that's definitely on point. I was trying to find uh, some of those statistics. Uh, this is just uh, some statistics I found <clears throat> from the um, – Washington Post, um, an article they put out quite a few years ago, uh, but they said both black and um, white and black poverty fell dramatically during the 1960s, though the drop in black poverty from 55.1% 55 .1 in 1959 to 32.2% in 1969 is particularly remarkable. And so it just shows like, you know, there is some uh, positives that come out of when you come out of that, that fourth turning. And so, and I think yeah, it, it, it is. And this is something that, you know, Thomas Piketty, he wrote that big, ah, you know, you talk about big tomes, right? Well, that's a big one. Thomas Piketty, Capital. Do you remember that book that came out? I mean, oh, that thing no. was this thick, you know? <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> anyway, he's sort of one of those French Marxists. You know, I think he not, he hangs out at UC Berkeley, <laughs> my alma mater, by the way, I think. Mm -hmm. but, but anyway, some of those French economists hang out there. But he wrote that book and one is his central tenant. I mean, it was a bestseller for years. But the central tenet of his book was the rate of return on capital always grows faster in the economy. Therefore, the rich get richer, you know, relative to wage, you know, to everyone else. That was sort of the fundamental thing. And, and he says, he said, that's always been true. That's what capitalism does. But then he sort of stopped and he said, well, of course, there's that great exception 
of course, the, you know, in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. In other words, exactly the fourth turning and the first turning, when he admitted that, of course, throughout the Western world, inequality went in reverse, right? So inequality fell slightly through the 30s, radically through the 40s and 50s, and continued to fall even to the late 1960s. And then it's begun, started rising again, right? Mm -hmm. So exactly as we would suggest, things become more, more equal during the fourth turning, fourth turning and subsequent first turning. And in fact, I think that's happened throughout history. Um, you think of the, the radical equality achieved by the Civil War, uh, if, you know, among other things, uh, uh, freedom for slavery. And that was a huge uh, a wealth loss for the South. Uh, you know, anyone who owned wealth uh, wealth in the South. But you saw that, too, during the American Revolution. You've seen that constantly as part of four turnings. And it's a wonderful really book quick, about Neil. that. Right. Really, really quick. Uh, I was I was uh, thinking about uh, I want to <laughs> chat with you about this anyway, because um, so Booker T. Washington is one of my uh, favorite. Uh, uh, and I consider him a hero. And so, um, you know, during, you know, we had the the civil the civil war and we came out of that fourth turning era. And then, yeah. you know, then we were in the first turning. And that's when I believe Booker T. Washington came to prominence and. You know, then there's this whole history with him and W. Du Bois, you know, where they begin to challenge like, you know, I think it was like pretty much the second turning, the, the early 1900s, where they begin yeah, to challenge exactly. the first, exactly. you know, so I, exactly. I, yeah. I, I was kind of intrigued by that, you know, when when well, uh, we, we we actually wrote about that in uh, in an earlier book called Generations, where we focus much more at each generation historically. But we talk about Booker T. Washington versus Du Bois, right? And we we absolutely talk about it as what we call the artist archetype versus the prophet archetype, you know, coming of age during the awakening. And it is absolutely an example of that, of, of, of sort of history repeating itself or, or a prequel to a sequel, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but you see that going again and again. There's a for people interested in this this trend about this relationship between crisis and equality, there's a wonderful book out by a uh, an economist, uh, Walter Scheidel at Stanford, uh, called "The Great Leveler," <clears throat> and the thesis of his book is is that throughout history, going all the way back to the Neolithic Revolution, I mean, even in the ancient world, he said the trend among societies that are basically prospering and not encountering any particular untoward event. Is they always become more unequal over time. <laughs> that's, mm -hmm. that's always true. Uh, in other words, in an urban civilization, that's always true. Yeah. He says equality, but of course that can't always be the trend. He says equality equality only increases during these periods of crisis and the reconstruction following them. And he lists the reasons for historically for these crises: state failure, revolution, total war pandemic i mean it sounds like the four horses of the you know the four horsemen of the apocalypse but 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 there he is um uh, a, a very interesting book again one of those huge tomes you know there it is but but he's a he's a he's a very erudite and and very um i should say scholarly um uh economic historian and and um a, a book that i think got not as much attention uh, as it as it deserved when it came out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And so, um, yeah, I, I got to check that out. I'm gonna add that to the bookshelf at some point. I got to finish reading yours first. You all be sure to go grab Neil's new book. The fourth turning is here if you haven't yet. Uh, so, Neil, I was wondering about uh, which I'm kind of starting to frame these these different concepts in my mind. Uh, so since the the 1970s, when we went off the gold standard, and uh, I believe uh, after that we began to offshore a lot of our production, and now there's now we're seeing trends within um, energy and and commodities and and uh, nations wanting to uh, focus on their own security, like like almost as if like uh, globalization is at risk in some in some form. Uh, shape or form. So, how does this industrialization look after the 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 fourth turning, uh, the current fourth turning that we're in? What what do you foresee? Um, how that's going to look, and as far as what assets uh, should people be considering? 
Hello everyone, sorry for the break in action, but I wanna tell you about the link in my description below. This is to the New Orleans Investment Conference. This conference has been around for years and have brought many people out such as Milton Friedman, Gerald Ford, Alan Greenspan, and Margaret Thatcher. This conference is put on by Brian Lundeen and his team. Brian is the CEO of Gold Newsletter. This year, they're going to have speakers such as Jim Rickards, George Gammon, Peter Schiff, Rick Rule, Danielle DiMartino Booth, Lynn Alden, and many others. Now, I encourage you to click the link in the description below. You can choose to attend the live event, which I will likely be at, as well as the event that is live streamed. You can support the channel by using my link below. So I encourage you to check that out. Now, let's get back to the interview. Well, we're now, you know, uh, from from the the late awakening and the unraveling, sort of the 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 little bit in the seventies, but particularly the eighties, nineties, and early oos, right? It was a time of globalization. I mean, everyone knows that, right? And we became this great globalized economy. Um, but since the fourth turning began, we've been going in the other direction. Um, global trade as a share of global product peaked in 2007, right? Just before the GFC. It's been going up and down, but it's basically been going down ever since, right? We're, we're beneath where we were back then. This is a huge reversal of trend, right? What everyone thought. And, and now we see uh, in China, for instance, imports and exports in huge, I mean, China now happens to find itself, I think, in trouble. But the trend now is onshoring or reshoring or friendshoring or nearshoring. In other words, it's the opposite of all that, right? We want to bring everything back into our community. And I think one of the most fascinating trends now is that politically and economically, back in the 1990s and early 00s, uh, during the Clinton or 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 um, or D.W. Bush years, I think um, the the real trend was is for our 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 politics or ideology among both parties was to become more progressive culturally but more sort of free market economically. You know what I mean? Uh, and you saw that among sort of, you know, a hipper style of republicanism, but then Democrats who also wanted to be very progressive culturally, but, you know, fiscal conservatives, you know, it's like uh, Bill Clinton talking about, you know, the era of big government is over, of course. So we're going to be like a, you know, we're going to be like a Tony Blair <laughs> uh, 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 lefty, you know, that is to say pretty conservative in the economy. I think today it's the opposite. I think today both parties are moving toward populism and progressivism in the economy. It's amazing to hear now, um, you know, even people like Marco Rubio and many of these conservatives sounding practically like uh, 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 Sanders. You know, I mean, they're in, they're in favor of community. They, they're in favor of stronger unions. They want to crack down on these woke corporations. But they want to crack down on them in a serious way. They want to break them up and you know, take their earnings and uh, uh, distribute them to workers. And you know they want all these new protections for 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 workers to to ensure that their standard of living growth for 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 individuals. And yet, in the culture, I think we're beginning to turn the opposite direction. I, I was curious the other day to find out that uh, this was uh, two or three weeks ago, for the first time ever on the. Uh, Hot Billboard 100, right? The top pop songs. For the first time ever, the top three were country western songs, and and it's and it's interesting to me when I when I look at how we're changing culturally and how we're changing in terms of our economic attitudes. It's it's I I, I see the beginning of a different delta. You know what I mean? In other words, the change in direction is going in a somewhat different way, and and to me, I find that fascinating because I have found that to be true during earlier fourth turnings as well, as, as the world becomes more unsettled and as people move toward this greater sense of community, this is what you see, right? Less individualism in, in economics and, and a little bit more traditionalism or conventionalism, maybe is a better way to say it, in the culture. Does that make sense to you? I, I've, yeah. I've been kind of looking around a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that that, that, makes, uh, that makes sense. And so, um, just looking at like going out uh, with the um, the onshoring, uh, you know, energy uh, security and things of that nature. I mean, right now there's acts passed for like to bring chips back to uh, build more nuclear reactors and 
um, and things of that yeah, nature. Buy Biden, American, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. buy American. Right, exactly. <laughs> and it even uh, Biden came out and uh, said, and I think it was in February that we're going to need oil for longer. I mean, it took him a while to admit that, but he he right. did come out and say that. And so uh, this that I mean, I think that does mean like more jobs and and things of that nature. Um, so as we like <clears throat> head towards you know the the end of this decade, I mean, I mean we're going into twenty twenty four. We're going into an election year. And uh, so what type of um, resources or, or commodities people should consider thinking about? I mean, because um, you mentioned well, remember, only assets. Remember one thing I said earlier on, I said for a turnings or an era when we remake the outer world, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's all about construction. It's all about building stuff, you know, in nature, right? We We transform and produce commodities and actually recreate the world. Uh, one of the things we saw during the last fourth turning was a tremendous interest in resource ex extraction. And they, and the, and during the 1930s, the dividing up in the world of the world into these autarkic zones that wouldn't trade with each other. You know, the Japan had their co-prosperity sphere and they're interested in getting enough oil for, you know, what they were doing, uh, invading other countries in the East and so on. But we were, we, because there was so much going on that was had to do with either building of infrastructure or frankly, the, the waging of war, everyone was really interested in resources. Right? They <laughs> needed stuff, right? And that was when the world came out of the Great Depression. And America too was interested in, in resources. Um, and I think that that is going to happen again today. We already see uh, defense uh, defense uh, globally is up. Uh, you know, we we can't keep we can't we can't even keep up with what Russia and the Ukraine are are actually um, uh, you know uh, consuming uh, every day. Uh, the worldwide production of uh, you know missiles and ammunition can't keep up with what these two countries are doing. So the America is doing everything it can. I mean, the Pentagon is 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 rapidly you know re trying to retool these factories. To, to, to make more of this stuff. And uh, practically every country is ramping up defense spending. We live in that kind of era. You saw Japan now is going to, and, and, and much of NATO is finally going to be spending 2% of GDP on defense. Well, it never did that before, right? So we see that going on in the world. I think unsexy sectors of the S&P, like materials, I can't think of a less... Uh, you know, a, a, a sector of the S&P, which has suffered from low valuations, right? More than materials, right? But these will be important again. And I think it's beginning to actually play a role in, in uh, public diplomacy. You see the Biden administration worried about elements no one even knew about, like tellurium and gallium, <laughs> or, you know, uh, to say nothing of, of 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 silicon and and uh and and lithium and and some of the rare earth metals. Well, what what's happening here? I thought it was all about experience economy and digital this, digital that. You know what I mean? I thought it was all about media companies. No, this is the new this is the new era of the fourth turning. Right? We're going to be worrying about stuff, and we're going to be worrying about energy, as you pointed out. So mm. this is the new reality, and. This stuff is important for the public good. How we reshape, you know, we we I think now uh, we're in its era of infrastructure. You remember the old the old joke during the Trump presidency was every week was going to be infrastructure week. Well, now we have Biden also bragging about all the infrastructure he's building. And one thing about these kinds of decisions is that they're all they all have to be public decisions, you know. Well, where's the infrastructure going to be? How are we going to restructure our communities? Where, where's all this? You know, where, where the shopping center is going to be? Where the highway is going to be? Right? Where's the, where's the internet going to be? And and so we all have to come together. And these are public decisions. When you're when you're when the top industries are focused on individual consumption items, like you know, the stuff I get on my iPhone, right? Those are personal individual decisions, right? And so no community is involved in that. We're moving away from the, what did I say at the beginning? We're moving away from the individual toward the community. And when you start building things to the community, 
everyone has to come together and decide how we're going to build them. Mm-hmm. And, and if you ask people where our productivity is lowest today, uh, where where do they think the standard of living is growing? It all has to do with things that we produce that have a collective dimension, right? Things that involve people coming together, like healthcare. I mean, a lot of most healthcare that matters most is public health, right? Or um, um, or social services or education. What about college education, right? If you ask people why their income isn't growing, they're not complaining that they don't they can't afford enough flat screen TVs, you know, to paper all the <laughs> paper all the walls of their of their of their living room. It's that they can't afford rent, which is construction. They can't afford health care. They can't afford college, right? You see where I'm going with this? It's all of this public stuff where our productivity over the past several decades has either been zero or negative, right? Construction has notoriously lower negative productivity rates. I don't even want to talk about education and healthcare. I think it's negative, if you ask me. But the public knows this. And that's why when they complain about lower declining standard of living, they always complain about those things. They don't complain about, you know, not being able to buy enough fast food. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or mm-hmm. not being able to get enough streaming online, right? And have enough movies on Netflix. That's not what they complain about. And that's that's where I suggest we're moving into this new era. It's going to be more about things, less than experiences. And I know the reason I say that is because over the past 20 years, everyone's been saying, oh, you know, the new economy is always about experiences. I think it's changing. I think it's an inflection point here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, so, Neil, as we wrap up, um, I wanted to touch on this uh, last topic, um, which is uh, – most of the times, uh, well, most of the times when we get to this crisis point in the fourth turning, uh, we've seen that it's involved uh, other nations. Um, I've heard you talk about, um, you know, the, the Revolutionary War. I mean, obviously World War II, um, and then here in this time we have, uh, you know, the formation of the BRICS nations um, and many countries that are like fed up with, you know, their their standard of living. And um, and wanting to have energy security for them and, and, you know, the dollar being weaponized and all these different things. Right. Uh, so uh, what's kind of your perspective on how that fits within, um, you know, a, a potential crisis? Some people have been concerned, like, OK, is this like a setup for another world war? Is this like, you know, what's kind of your take on this? Well, I think, look, I think <clears throat> China and Russia would like BRICS to become an anti-Western grievance group. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what they would like, right? I mean, they are kind of allies now, right? And and both of them have reason not to like the West, and they're analogizing their situation with each other. You know, China is now talking about, you know, America and Japan and North Korea like the NATO of the Pacific. I mean, you get it. It's like Russia complaining about the NATO of Europe. In other words, so so they already have this grievance, right? This huge chip on their shoulder about how the West is down on them. Putin talks about it all the time, you know, and, and, and Xi Jinping is doing the same thing. They would like to do it. The problem is, is getting the other members of the BRICS to go along. Um, Narendra Modi and, uh, 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 and, uh, you know, the, the presidents of, uh, of, of of South Africa and you know Lula in 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 Brazil, they're all there in Johannesburg right now, right? With one exception, Putin, he's not there because he would be arrested if he show up in South Africa. <laughs> he's been convicted of war crimes by the International Criminal Court, and so if he shows up in South Africa, he'd actually be put in the dock. He would never go back to Russia. So he's he's like tuning in and Zoom. So it's an odd meeting, you know what I mean? That one of the leaders can't even show up in the country, right? So now they do have a new development bank, which I think uh, is Dilma Rousseff, I think, of, uh, you know, former uh, president of Brazil, who's head of that. And she talks about getting, you know, a non-dollar, you know, going off the dollar somehow. Maybe we could, you know, gold or somehow a combination of our currencies. But so far as I know, the New Development Bank is still extending its loans in dollars. <laughs> so mm-hmm. they're not doing it. Here's the problem that they face. The dollar is such an extraordinarily great 
uh, 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 safe haven currency, right? That's the problem. First of all, it's, uh, you know, for, for if you're a less developed country or if you're a new uh, an emerging market country, you have dollars, it typically keeps its value if your currency goes down. That's the first thing you're looking for. Number two, you can easily invest it to get return on it because the dollar, there is no bond market, there is no um, uh, lending market that's as liquid and global as a dollar, right? So it has this amazing quality. You can buy and sell securities at any duration instantly on global markets, right? And thirdly, and this is the killer, whenever the, the world experiences a crisis, even if the US causes the crisis, the dollar always goes up. So that's like a killer. Yeah, that, that's the <laughs> ultimate asset, right? How can you... How can you keep, you would be a dereliction of duty if you were a head of a, of a sovereign wealth fund or, or, a, or a central bank and you did not hold liquidity in dollars, that would almost be a crime. You know what I mean? Given these incredible attributes of dollar, why does the dollar go up in times of crisis? Because everyone figures that if whatever hits the fan, right, if everything really goes down, America will be where the whatever stability is left, right? And it's really going to be hard for the BRICS to break through that one. I don't know what's your opinion on that, but that's how I see it. Yeah, um, I, I'm just kind of gathering information <laughs> and trying to trying to uh, you know figure it out. Uh, I do think about the uh, you know when Nixon took us off the dollar standard and we had the agreement with Saudi Arabia. Um, when we went on the petrol dollar standard and now Saudi Arabia, I think has an application with the BRICS. Um, and so I've seen some tension there, you know, I mean, I think Biden went out there and wouldn't, I mean, the guy wouldn't shake his hand or something like that. You yeah. Know? Well, they, they did the little, uh, it was during the <laughs> pandemic. They did a thing like that, but, but, but the thing with Saudi Arabia is Saudi Arabia gets torn, right? Because it, it, yeah, it wants it wants a high dollar, and what's another country in the world that really wants a high dollar? Well, Putin, right? So they have this that they have that commonality of interest. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, with regard to the geopolitical situation in the in the Middle East, America is a lot more powerful in the end, right, than Russia mm -hmm. is, particularly now that Russia is totally caught up in the the Ukraine war, right? So 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 that's the problem. Is that is it you? The other problem is this, is that is that people may not know that, but China is 70% of the GDP and the trade of the BRICS. That is, you add all the BRICS together, like China is this dominant, right? So a lot of it is going to be China, right? Mm -hmm. So you really have to think about that. It's These aren't five co-equal partners, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. it's fair to say. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's, what do you think about, so um, in terms of that, like, Obviously, we've had like, you know, the ESG crowd and, you know, kind of like the energy war. Um, I mean, we saw a lot when Putin and Russia invaded Ukraine and, you know, Putin would stop the pipelines and all these different things. Right. And so now um, I'm thinking about, you know, even when you have OPEC um, and you have, you know, the uh, the pressure of like, you know, uh, decarbonizing and such. And so. Um, uh, what's your take on how that plays with trade with other nations and and you know the OPEC nations and things like that? You know, well, that's that's a big question. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it it's is. ESG and energy and all the rest. Look, I think um, um, I think that uh, I think that energy and resources will play a larger role in the world to come. I think ESG concerns are obviously there, uh, but I think they need to play a realistic, you know, they have to be proportioned realistically to the more immediate concerns of the need for countries for commodities, right? And to keep their populations heated and cooled. Uh, you look at you look at Germany and uh, how, how difficult Germany is now doing. And a lot of it is because they were so enthusiastic about embracing alternative energy sources, shutting down their nuclear. And then guess what happened? You had a war, suddenly gas prices went through the roof and now look, Germany is suffering. I mean, Germany uh, may have no GDP growth this year. I mean, not just two quarters, but maybe a third or a fourth quarter of zero or negative GDP growth. So 
I think the lesson is, is that people realize um, it, uh, whatever long-term problem that uh, climate change uh, poses, uh, it needs to be kept in perspective. You need to get through the near term to be there in the longer term. And, and you need to do it in a way which is also fair and equitable to a lot of the less developed countries that need conventional energy sources. I mean, this is the other problem, right? And by the way, one of the things the BRICS complain about are these ESG policies and so on, and very you know pro-environmental policies that actually put the less developed countries in a more disadvantageous situation for development. I mean, it's easy to make energy really expensive if you're a very high-income economy, right? Mm -hmm. But but what if you're Nigeria? What if you're uh, Mali? What if you're, right? How are you ever going to develop? Uh, you're nowhere near the ability to have any of these um, uh, very advanced forms of energy. You're still you're still trying to afford basic forms of you, you can't even give electricity reliably to even half your population. You can't even have electricity flowing continuously in your hospitals, right? From from an oil burning or coal burning uh, um, uh, plant. And yet here you are talking about all this expensive transition that you have no way to afford. I mean, you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. This becomes very problematic uh, for for these countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Neil. I appreciate that wealth of information, man. How much reading do you do? <laughs> I, 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 do a, I do a bunch. I do a bunch. But, you know. I'm curious. That's the main thing. That's good. That's good. Well, we appreciate your time and, and being on the show today, man. Just this was very valuable. And I believe the audience will get a lot of value from this. Thank, thank you. Man. It was a pleasure to be here, Daryl.